Welcome to the Prolific Creations Podcast. Today I am joined by Paul Black, cinematographer and commercial content creator. So thank you, Paul, for joining us today. Of course, dude. Happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you. Well, um, can you kind of just break down? I know, you know, as we mentioned earlier, cinematographer and commercial content creator. Can you kind of walk us through on what it means to be uh, a cinematographer? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, What it means to be a cinematographer is essentially in a film capacity. We're talking about feature film, short film, cinematic capacity, that kind of thing that you're working on a film set. Cinematographer is at the top of the pile when it comes to the camera crew. So we have in film, we have a number of different heads of departments. Okay, We have the producer who's in charge of the legal side and the paperwork and the hiring and the firing. We have the director who's looking at the overall tone of this. And then you have what's called the cinematographer. And underneath the cinematographer would have been essentially be camera operators, gaffers, all that kind of stuff. Um, And cinematographer would be the top of that that has a bird's eye view of anything technical that you see on a film. Not necessarily what is said, not necessarily the story, but how something is seen usually goes through the hands of a cinematographer. The other term for cinematographer, as you'll see, uh, you may see this term more in uh, credits for short films or credits for feature films, is the term director of photography. Director of photography and cinematographer are interchangeable titles. Okay. So not one of those has, a, I guess, further meaning to... Um, you know, one over the other? I mean, not to my knowledge. <laughs> um, director of photography is is something a little bit more formal than cinematographer. Um, but yeah, ultimately, director of photography or cinematographer is the head of the camera department, which is the visuals of motion pictures. Okay. So then can you kind of, kind of lead us into what got you into cinematography and to, I guess, have or want that position to where, hey, you know, everything that goes in the camera just gets run by you. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, when I was a kid, I've told the story a lot is, but it's really how I got into uh, filmmaking and really channeled into my creative flow is when I was a kid, I would believe I was about 10 years old and my grandparents from Arizona came and visited uh, my family in Southern California. And when they did, this was back, Lucas, this was back in uh, like 95. And back in about 95, this is where home video cameras were really starting to make an edge in the market. And uh, they brought with them a consumer home video camera. It was a VHS home video camera. You put it up on your shoulder like this, eyepiece here. Kind of oh, what's a VHS? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it was called a Magnavox Movie Maker. And when they left after um, after they visited and they took off, they accidentally left this, at the time, like this $1,000 camera. Right. Um, and I was, at the time, I, was, I think I was nine years old, and my mind was just blown at this piece of tech. And you see this piece of tech, which is something that we have, we have them in our pockets now. But back in 95, like it was a privilege and it was a rarity to be able to capture something visually on tape or on film. And so I got a hold of this camera and they were going to pick it up next time they saw me. And I knew that the pressure was on to maximize the potential of this piece of tech from 95. And I just started making movies at the time. This would have been around when a movie called Independence Day came out. And so Mm. I was obsessed with Independence Day. And I just wanted to make Independence Day. And didn't have any money. I was just some flipping kid at at my house and just started like setting this up on my dresser and being like, oh my gosh, there's an alien behind me kind of thing. So I did that over the summer. um, Just obsessively made movies by myself over a summer. And then eventually... Uh, my friends got involved and interested in this. It was like, I want to make a movie too. So I would grab friends and uh, Paul's house, you know, t- nine, 10 year old Paul suddenly turned into the place where you go make movies. You go make little videos, you know, kind of thing. Um, 
that continued on Lucas until I became a teenager, late teens, 16, 17 years old. Um, and I was looking for work and I got a job as an apprentice at a media company um, because they didn't need to pay me anything for this. Right. So I essentially was uh, an unpaid intern at this media company and I worked my way. I was, I was trained for about three years in field broadcast production. Essentially, I was trained in how to uh, produce news segments and all that. I'm standing here outside of this building, you know. So that's where I was formally trained. And at the end of that internship, um, I was offered the chance to essentially produce a television show. And it was on um, network TV. It mm -hmm. was called Bites. Um, it was a religious based TV show, religious youth oriented TV show called Youth Bites. And essentially, I had a company that wanted a slot on these uh, TV stations. And we had these TV stations that were desperate, was desperate for modern content, because all of their content was like 20 years old. Right, right. And so we struck a deal, a no pay deal, which essentially means they can pad out their uh, network uh, runtime of, hey, we've got a slot on Thursday morning at 2 a.m. that we just, we don't have any content. So they got free content. We got free publicity out of right. it because content was on it. So we made this deal. Um, and realistically is we had next to no budget to make this television show. We had to fill up a half hour slot. And I think they were airing us once a week and we were already behind the gun on this. And we essentially created uh, two 30-minute TV shows every month um, just on a, a shoestring budget. And it was right. just me operating, which I, you know I had done for 10 years. I was 20 at the time. Me operating. I had a host, maybe a sound engineer, and I would edit the pieces. So... All that ended up that after the show, the show had a five-year run, um, won numerous wow. like awards, tele uh, tele awards, and all that kind of stuff. At the end of that, I transitioned my career from television into documentaries because part of the TV show was it was essentially a travel show as well. So I was able to travel to like these thirty-plus countries and establish relationships in all these countries with fellow right. nonprofit religious organizations, and. From doing the TV show and building these organizations, I was able to tra transition that into documentary storytelling because I had all these connections around the world. So I continued to um, transition from television into documentary production. And then that ultimately le left me with Phil of that mountain in television that I wanted to conquer. But I didn't have a lead in to television, uh, a lead into Phil, not like the way I did to television. And I knew that I had to essentially build this myself. I had to build my opportunity to be in film because that's what they always say is like, you look at Los Angeles and to make it in Los Angeles and film is essentially like winning the lottery, you know? Right. And for me, it's like, I'm, I'm in my late thirties now. It's like, I have no interest in playing the lottery with my career. You know, right. I'd rather, I'd rather create things on my own terms. And that's exactly what I did with, a group of filmmakers about three years ago was I created a company. We created a company together called phase three. And so now I was stacked with these amazing filmmakers, um, producers and audio engineers. And, and really that was my opportunity to not have to wear so many hats of, I have to run sound and I have to edit and I have right. to direct and I have to produce. And that was my big thing of what is the one thing that is most important to me. And what is the one thing that's most important in film? A lot of people say that's what is what you say in a film. Mm, but really, yeah. if what you say is the most important thing in film, why do we have silent films? Right. It's what you see. Mm. What you see is the most important. It sets the tone uh, right. for a film. And so that's essentially long-winded, Lucas. That was my journey to cinematographer. Okay. Is that... It started, it started with me behind a camera when I was 10 years old. And then through all these 
uh, different career ventures and television shows and being on TV and creating these documentaries, it ended with me behind the camera as well. Um, right. Because for me, it's like it, it's a place that you have such absolute bliss and control. Um, right. And film is all about absolute control, you know, right. um, control over lighting, control over sound, control over story is it is a medium that is drenched in perfection and drenched yeah. in controlling the uncontrollable. Mm. Poetic, but cheesy. <laughs> so then going back to when you said, you know, when you interned for three years, right? Because I mean, that's, that's a long time, right? Three years of your life, because at that point, you know, uh, we're taught, especially now these days that, hey, you know, time is super valuable, right? Time can even be more valuable than, you know, money in a sense. And so I know you mentioned that you went straight in from interning and that they offered you a position. Was that position promised or was it like, hey, just intern for us and then oh, kind yeah. of see where it goes from there? It was, it was not promised at all. No way. Um, because like that venture, from the minute that they, uh, the company, the organization came up with that venture to create content for TV and assigning it to me, we're talking that was probably 48 hours. Of we have this opportunity and Paul's going to do it. I was just simply there to learn. And one of the things about seeing how this is a creative podcast, one of the big things, at least for me in my creative work, is that I have to absolutely have a demand put on me and I have to be held accountable with my time. Because I am not terribly the most disciplined person when it's completely up to me what I do with my time. If I have a free day um, and no one's counting on me, no one's relying on me to be anywhere or produce anything, bro, I barely put shoes on. You know, I'm basically on my couch hauled up playing video games all day. Right. But you do this enough as a creative and you do this enough as an artist that you understand that you need to be held accountable to something outside of yourself. Right. And I think that's a lot of the times that a hiccup happens with uh, creatives is that they're waiting to be moved. They're waiting to be to feel something in order to express it, which a lot of times you have to assign external things right. in order to be moved, you know. Right. But to answer your question about the internship, no. But when I was a teenager, that was not, no, that was not promised to me when I was a teenager. But I knew that I needed to be under an accountability to show up somewhere and to learn something. If that wasn't the case, I probably would have spent the bulk of my teenage years just in my room playing Final Fantasy. Okay. <laughs> and so you continue to pursue that then was it? I don't know, money ever a factor, right? Because when you talk to youth now, right, a lot of the times they're either not motivated to do something or they won't get that outside discipline to hold them accountable unless either, you know, quick fame is promised or just a lump of money. So kind of, you kind of talk about, just, you know, besides wanting to learn the ins and outs, is there anything else that motivated you to be like, hey, you know what, three years is a long time, but I'm going to stay committed to this. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, for me, it has always been the case that um, the money that I have made doing creative work has always been equal portions. It's always been equal to the amount of work that I've put in. Okay. And I've always been very, very aware of that, of the input and the output of certain things. And so it's difficult, Lucas, because Film has a different stigma to it than other art endeavors, okay. right? Can you elaborate a little bit more? If you're a painter, yeah. you already know the risk. You know the risk that this may not make you any money. Right. If you are a musician, we already have that stigma that you could easily not make any money being a musician. You know? Yeah. In film, it's different because we have this um, we have this ideology that film and Hollywood as a business are they're inseparable, mm -hmm. yeah. and so we look at I'm in film, 
And we pair that with I'm in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood is a business of making right. films. Right. And then that equals money. Does that make sense? Yeah. So one of the big things that my path in filmmaking was it was outside of Hollywood. And so there was never promised a million dollar check or, right. you know, a $2 million signage deal for this. My background has always been a technician is, and we know that technicians, like I said, is if you do the hard work as a technician, this is what you can expect to be paid. Now there is a cap to that um, as a technician, but for me is technicians are similar to coders in the computer world of you can have all the amazing, brilliant film directors that you want that say, I have an amazing story and don't know anything about how to operate a camera, don't know anything about how to edit, uh, don't know anything about how to run audio and get clean audio and all that. That is really, they live and die off their technicians. So us as technicians, me as a technician, because that, that's really part of what cinematography is, understanding the technical side of it, you put yourself under people that you believe in. When you put yourself under people that you believe in, that you know will take care of you, um, money will not be a deficit. And I can say that firsthand because I have done television work. I've done documentary work. I've freelanced. I freelanced for five, seven years of going to clients and working by making quality content for them, for their vision. Yeah. Uh, and I've made my living through that. Yeah. You know, and I've got a I've got a wife and a house and all that is like it. But yeah, if you have the technical foundation and you know how to identify. Identify someone with a vision. Mm -hmm. Is. You won't have to worry about having a successful career. Right. Right. And so then as a cinematographer, do you think especially with, you know, now that you're further in the business, now that you know so many other cinematographers, so many other people in the same industry. Do you think then that not having that focus of, hey, like if I do this, I'm gonna make a bunch of money, right? As opposed to then instead of doing that, it's, hey, you know what? I'm just here to learn. I'm here to, to you know, get that mentorship. Do you think that has given you maybe just a, a, not a one up, but just an edge of like, hey, like because I'm not in it for the money, you know, I have a, a whole different perspective, a whole different mindset of how I want to approach, you know, this this talent. Yeah. One of the big things with my skill set, the skill set that I've cultivated, and it's it's one of those things, Lucas, that you don't really think of what your skill set is until you're 10 years into your career. You know, mm -hmm. you have no idea what you're able to do until about, I would say, about 10 years into your career. Um, but one of the things and one of the things that I've learned with this is talking about creativity is it's not enough for you to make a career off of your creativity. And a lot of people miss that. Uh, a lot of people have that disconnect that I'm a creative person. And so I should make money off of this. Mm. Creativity is energy. Um, creativity is energy. And the only way to monopolize on that energy is if you cultivate it. Yeah, for sure. If you ap approach it with discipline, if you add discipline to that creativity. Right. You know? And so one of the big things is, yes, I started off with, you know, I was one of those kids when I was filming that I was, I was a typical nineties kid with my, uh, my mother parenting me that I was praised as, oh, he's just a creative person. So any defect, any bad attitude, any acting out that I did was always covered by, oh, he's just creative, mm. you know? Um, and I've seen that as a massive deficit in all hemispheres of creative, uh, let's say creative arts, is that people say, it's like, well, I can write a song on my guitar. So I don't need to learn self-discipline. I don't need to learn how to sell myself. I don't need to learn uh, how to submit to authority and identify right. good clients or anything like that because right. I have this gift that most people don't, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, that's and a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
Yeah. Um, and, and of course that was for me when I was a young teen of like, hey, I'm the only one making movies and I know how to press record and I know how to like all this kind of stuff. But it wasn't until I interned at that organization is where I actually learned show up at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Leave at five. Don't leave early. Don't show up late. You know, here's how you present yourself. Here's how you do your taxes. Here's how you take care of your car. You know, all of these kind of things that, you know, life kind of smacks you in the back of the head yeah. when you turn into an adult and be like, I can't just live and die off my creativity. Right. You know, right. I have to discipline it. I have to cultivate it. I have to pair this. And when you pair it and when you add discipline and you pair it to these other things, um, it just increases tenfold. It just right. is more ammunition in your gun, you know? Right. But yes, is I've absolutely seen. Um, so that was personally for me my path, and so not going the Hollywood route immediately, but cultivating uh, your technical skills, cultivating how to speak to clients and all that. Uh, that led me on a different kind of path. Right, right, yeah. And it's inspiring to see that you know you took a different path than what is. I guess, popularized in today's times, uh, especially now that social media is so much bigger with TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you know, um, I was talking to a content creator for uh, uh, an escape room owner um, and their content manager. And um, one of the things that she mentioned that I found baffling was like um, that she will post on Facebook, she'll post on Instagram, maybe LinkedIn, but she won't post mm -hmm. on TikTok. Hmm. And I was like, you know, that's so bizarre because usually you hear of all these you know, quote unquote, famous people of uh, becoming famous through TikTok. And she said, no, because it's too easy. You post something, wow. you know, ridiculous and you get, you know, a million views, but that's it. It doesn't become anything more than more of it. And so wow. hearing you see that, hey, like, it's not just you, first of all, figuring out what that creative outlet is, but it's more than just, hey, this is what I can do. You know, like a one note Johnny, I can play, you know, the song on the guitar. I mean, it may not even be good. And then come to find out, like, you know, there's more to it. You need to discipline and, you know, continue to cultivate that skill, as you mentioned, and just be get better at it. And oh. um, I don't know, just, again, going back to the youth that I work with now, seniors, juniors, you know, a lot of them are like, I think I want to be an actor. Oh, great. You know, have you ever done any plays? Have you, you know, no, yeah. you know I think I want to be a, a police officer. Uh, oh, okay. I mean, you know, what happened to actor that you were talking about last week? Hey, I, my mom just got me a guitar. I think I want to play guitar. I think that's what I want to do with my career. I'm like, oh, like, do you know any chords? No, but oh, man, I, I just feel it. And so, you know, can you, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's inspiring that, you know, that you're running with it and you've just had that discipline and just cultivated your talent into something from, you know, just, hey, nine-year-old Paul, this is what, I, you know, let's try this out for fun to, this is where I'm at now, right? Yeah. Um, I think you're a great example of, you know, just harnessing that discipline and, you know, running with it. Well, I think one of the things, Lucas, is the landscape, and it's a landscape that has, you know, it's the landscape has been altered for every creative job. Really, it's getting to be almost every career. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the advent of social media in the last, oh gosh, it's going to go on 20 years now. Um, where fame is such a driving force yeah. uh, to young people's decision making. Yeah. And it's the same. I work with a lot of young people is, you know, one of the most gratifying things that I do um, is to teach young people filmmaking and to give them the opportunity gratefully because of the company phase three and everything that we've done is to give them the opportunity immediately. They're 18 and they're like, I want to be a director, you know, and to give them immediately an opportunity to be on a set and say, okay, well, immediately put that into practice. But yeah. one of the things to what you're saying about uh, social media and these people wanting, they're pursuing the fame of it. And there's really nothing wrong with that. It's been heavily emphasized more in the last yeah. 20 years or so. And it's interesting because why are they wanting to pursue the fame? And this is an innate drive for all of us to have of, 
you know, I don't think anyone is beyond wanting all that money and all that fame, but what really is the driving force behind that? And one of the thing, one of the things that I think is a driving force behind the young people wanting their notoriety and wanting fame is to be immortal, is to be yeah. invincible from things, right. is to be, is to be remembered and to be known, you know, and it is in direct contrast to what the reality of this current generation is going through, you know is that most of this current generation, teens and 20s, are um, in their rooms, on their couches, on their phone. And so they don't have that immediate community to reach out to, to navigate. And so you have now the contrast of a lack of community here, and now this these huge dreams of having a uh, 10 million uh subscription or a 10 million person following. Um, and those two things for me are the reality of where this generation is and what their dreams are, are com continuing to be split. And yeah. they're continuing to contrast farther and farther away from each other. Right. Have you seen the yeah. same thing? Oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, even, you know, living in California and working with youth to interacting with, you know, other, you know, people in, in the church that we would go to, to, you know, working in high school now and, and just the conversations I have on the daily with some students is just, it's baffling of yeah. where that discipline is at, mm -hmm. um, where they draw their motivation from, um, or I guess lack of motivation for some cases, um, sure. and just how it influences their everyday life and what they want to do outside of high school, right? Or, you know, what career they want to pursue. Yeah. And, and and Lucas is my my motivation. One of the motivations that I've always had in filmmaking is to always be a student and always be a teacher simultaneously. Yeah. For it's sure. funny. I was doing a piece on the uh, the Dead Sea in Israel. It's a sea that basically touches Israel. It touches Jordan. I believe it touches Egypt and it touches Saudi Arabia. And the thing is completely dead. It can't support life. Okay. Right. And I was doing this piece and over the years of thinking about the state of like this, the sea, um, why can't a sea like the Dead Sea or here, the Salton Sea right here in California, why can't it support life? And it's because this body of water has no inlet and it has no outlet. Mm -hmm. It is completely isolated unto itself. Yeah. And so it can't get rid of its toxins and it can't take fresh water in and the water sits there and it can't support life. For me, creatively, it's the same approach right. is that you need to constantly be identifying, have the humility to identify right. people that are yeah. better than you yeah. at a particular skill and identify the people that are looking up to you and wanting to be where you're at in a year and two years and three years. And right. always for me is I've always positioned myself under people that I respect, that I admire their skill, and that I'm completely open to uh, open with them, that I want to learn this thing that they know, I want to have this thing that they have. And the moment that I get it, find someone to give it to, find right. someone to teach, because that completes the circuit. Now yeah. your creativity, now your art is full of life because it's yeah. not just about glorifying yourself and look what I'm able to do because right. you're part of this intricate system that creatively is flowing through and creativity yeah. is only paired with knowledge. Right. And so you have the knowledge to discipline yourself and to uh, exercise your creativity, immediately teach someone else how to do the same. And I yeah. guarantee you, you have that mentality, you'll never have a bad day. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I like what you said, just is that that first step of just having that humility to first of all learn from somebody. Oh my right. gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely a big one. Um, and I like what you mentioned that that creativity is energy and just like you said, just create, completing that circuit, right? I think for most creators or creators that I've interacted with, it's kind of just, they get it, they might learn it from someone with a, and you know, from YouTube or, you know, mm -hmm. some famous influencer that they, that they follow and then it just stays there. 
and it, yeah. it's not turned around, like you mentioned. It's not passed on to you know other people that are wanting to learn or other people that are wanting to that, that look up to them, right? And yeah. and and I know you mentioned that hey, that having that humility of asking those that are, I guess, are, I guess better or more skilled in a certain aspect. How has that changed in your creates your creative process from when you, you know, first had your own you know TV series to where you are now? How has that evolved throughout the, um, all this time? Okay, yeah, I got you. For me, there's a number of other examples I can give of being in a band or um, something else like that. That is like creative that you're working in a group, but for me is filmmaking is incredibly driven by collaboration. It, it's There's really no way to get around it. Now, when I was doing television is I was able to get around not wor working with as little people as possible. This is the same thing with documentaries. I could work with as little people as possible. When you get to a place that you're on a platform of filmmaking and you're having to have, like we talked about earlier, you're having to have control over everything you have to give some of your power away to other people for the common good of creating this film right and so immediately when you say i have to give up my control i have to give up my power that's a hard thing to swallow you know mm. but it's because you've identified something more important than yourself yeah and that's a beautiful thing is for me ultimately what i always say is like to the crew mainly like my camera crew is hey for the next 24 hours or the next 48 hours when we're doing this thing the film is god i'm not you're not this is not up to us this is not up to me being right this is not up to you being wrong mm. this is about what is best for this movie you know mm. but yeah. absolutely is you know having that place that uh really to identify people that are better than you at things. That's where yeah. collaboration comes from, you know, because I could probably say for like cinematography, I could probably score a solid six or seven in every area of filmmaking, but I had to go find the nines and the tens. Right. You know, and right. when you change your mentality to say, this is not about me. This is about me identifying talent in other people Yeah, is the first part. But the second part to identifying talent in other people, and this is something that I highly believe in, is that you have to put a demand on their talent. Mm -hmm. It's one thing for someone to be talented at, like in your example of playing the piano, or for me to be able to take a shot or film a video or something. It's one thing for someone to be talented. That's one half of it. The other side is you have to put a demand on that talent, a demand on that gifting that they have. And that's where often is the tyrannical part of you says, okay, we're making this movie on this date come hell or high water. There's no more time to plan. There's no more time for anything. This is the date. You set a date and you hold it and you say, I'm demanding, I'm putting a demand on your gifts. I'm putting a demand on Paul as a cinematographer. Um, and that's a really hard thing for a creative to do is because they want to exist in an infinite space. They yeah. want to exist in a place that time uh, is limitless, that you can hold this thing in your heart, this song or this movie in your heart for as long as you want, because you're still thinking about it. It's not ready. Right. But you have to put a deadline on that. And a right. big thing, and I know you know the same thing with in creativity is a big part of that is you have to put a deadline on it and you have to know when to walk away from yeah, a project. For sure. For you sure. have to know and say, in my mind, this thing was a 12 out of 10. It was going to be a masterpiece. It was going to be better than any Steven Spielberg thing ever. And, but and now it's a six out of ten. Now it's a four out of ten. Yeah. But but it exists now. Yeah, for sure. Flawed and imperfect, but it exists now. Right. And for me, it's always the thing as creative, you know, uh, with creative people is we as creative people spend far too much time on our projects. 
we linger on them unless we have the accountability to ourselves and the demand from other people saying, okay, Paul, that was a five out of 10, but next week you're working on another movie. Right. You know, and maybe that one's going to be a six out of 10 and a seven out of 10. And then this one's a five out of 10, but you've got this upward trajectory of project after project, after project, yeah. after project, you know, and I see, I see far too many times that a filmmaker will have a script up in their closet for 10 years and right. pull it out every two years and they'll work on it and all that. And they'll say, Oh yeah, I, you know, I'm a filmmaker. Well, what are you working on? What are you working on now? You know? Oh, I, right. well, I have a script for a feature film. Can I see it? No, it's not ready yet. Well, how long has it been? Mm -hmm. It's been 12 years. It's like, just get it done. Cause right. it's not going to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect. You know? Right. Yeah. Do you agree the same thing, the same thing in your world as oh, well? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and you know, it's sad. Even playing for myself, you know, from experience of, you know, I've played piano, I've been playing piano for, you know, 10, 12 years. I've been teaching for five or five or six years now. Yeah. And so, and one of the things, you know, I, I would I would have hoped that I would, you know, had known this earlier and got it through my head of just doing it, right? Literally just, hey, even if it's not perfect, just do it. And so now... Every time I, I, I uh, get a new student, I'm like, you know, don't worry about the mistakes. It's yeah. not going to be perfect. You're yep. still learning. One of the yep. things I try to emphasize is like, you're still learning. Like, just do it. Even if it doesn't stop, that's what I'm here to do is to help you, right? Because I'll have a student and like every single little thing, oh, ah, dang, ah, darn, mm -hmm. right? I want to start over. I want to start over. I want to start over. And I'm like, no, like, we need to move on. Like, hey, this isn't perfect, but we need to move on. And and one of the things that you mentioned is just it's that experience, Right. I think, I think that's what some people forget. What some creators will forget. It's like, if you don't do it, there's no experience. Even yeah. if you do it and it's bad, you're still gaining that experience. And, and again, I wish I had known that early, even starting a YouTube channel, like every person that you're like, Oh, you want to start a YouTube channel? Just do it. Your first video is not going to be it. I'm like, nah, like I had to create the perfect script. Like you said, I need to make you sure I have the right. Like, you have to have, like, yeah, man, I get it. Totally. Exactly. Get it. <laughs> I was like, my first video. Yeah. I was like, I'm glad I did it. You know, now we're 20, 25 videos in and like, and one of the things that I remember, one of the, the things that just stick in my head every time I make a video is try to make at least one thing better than the last video. And yeah. that way you're, first of all, getting that experience, but having that goal, putting that demand in your mind of like, hey, what is one thing that I can do to make the next video better? What is yeah. one thing that I can say? One thing that I can include, you know, maybe a different angle, maybe, maybe, you know, a different setting on the lighting, whatever it may be. What is that one thing that I can do? And hey, it's not going to be a 10 as much as I want it to be. Right. Mm -hmm. But again, just gaining that experience. And again, exactly. I, did just, I try to emphasize that so much to my students. And yeah, it's it's uh, and it's awesome once they get it like, hey, like, you know, it wasn't perfect, but I did that. Yeah. Like like you know you did that nobody can take that away from you well lucas it's one of the biggest things is you know there's a graveyard of projects in every creative person's mind and it's a damn tragedy yeah. you know and i take your podcast for example on this is that this could have been a fleeting thought in your mind that you could have talked to yourself out the morning after you thought of it you know oh there have been times trust me <laughs> And, and I've, I've, since we talked about this months ago about what you've been doing is obviously, you know, I've had a keen eye on what you've seen and I see you come up on my feet and all that. And it's one of the things that I was so excited to be a part of this um, because I know how important it is to make these projects real hmm. and making projects real is far more important to making projects perfect you know, and that's one of the big things in film that I'm constantly finding with young people that want to be filmmakers is that they want to be filmmakers. Is that they will become filmmakers when they make a Marvel movie, when they direct mm -hmm. a Marvel movie, then they're a filmmaker, you know. Okay. And one of the things that what you've been able to benefit from of even having this interview on online is one of the things that you've been able to benefit from is the same thing I'm benefiting from with film is that there is no better time and more accessible time to make movies than now. Right. We have the technology in our pockets to make movies. Yeah, for sure. 
you know, and for the last hundred years is movie making has been relegated to a city. And one of my biggest things that I communicate to young filmmakers or people that are just mildly interested in film is I always say the same thing as filmmaking is for everyone. Right. The same way music making music is the same way painting is for everyone. Filmmaking is for everyone, but we don't have that mentality. We say that those people over there in that part of the world make movies and I watch them. Mm. Yeah. But you, everyone has their idea for a movie. Right. But they can't do it. They say they can't do it. Well, why not? What's stopping you at this point? Well, I'm not in Hollywood. I don't have this budget. And some of the most phenomenal stories are coming out of independent film right now. Right. Yeah. And so for me, in, you know, in this, in these, for me, in this last the last couple decades or so of where filmmaking is and how everything is just turned upside down, my big thing is with all creatives that are interested in film is don't let anything tell you that filmmaking is relegated to just these people or just right. this group with this money is anyone can make a film and most people can make a damn good one too. Right. Do you think there's a reason why people will, you know, essentially con- confine themselves to that bubble of, you know, I don't live here or I don't have this, so I can't do it? Well, I, I'll, I'll just tell you the first thing that came into my head. Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Like any project is, is, you know, yeah. how many dead books, how many books are lying dead in someone's head? You know, right. it's incredibly difficult to make film, you know, but it's not outside the realms of possibilities. It's mm-hmm. just a lot of hard work to right. do it. And so a lot of things is, look, between you and I and everyone else that watches this about creativity, creative people, including me, including you, we're very lazy people, just inherently is because we exist so much in our heads and we can entertain ourselves naturally such lazy people um and that's why we have to cultivate this with discipline you know and not being afraid of the hard work but i've i've spoken to countless aspiring filmmakers over the years of i have this story in my heart i have this story in my head and i give them the opportunity of like Hey, we have an army of filmmakers that will get behind you and make this happen right. for free. Right. Professional cinematographers, professional audio engineers, because we are dying for the experience. Right. And we'll come alongside you and we'll make this happen for you. You just deliver the goods. And they yeah. say, I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, right. um, because it is it is this level of being seen that is mm. very difficult for people. It's an incredible amount of vulnerability, as we yeah, know, sure. Um, sure. to show ourselves. It's very uncomfortable and it's very difficult to put yourselves out there. Yeah. Um, but for me, my hope is that um, the next generation of filmmakers will learn that lesson sooner rather than later, that it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are. You have the tools right now to make film don't relegate to film is just a Disney thing or a Marvel thing or, you know, star Wars are movies and Marvel's movies and all that. And it's like, yes, of course they are, but there's different calibers of film, you know? Yeah. Um, And it's incredibly crucial right now. It's incredibly crucial for people to understand that, that they don't have that apprehension to get into film. Right. Because if they don't, if they continue to just tell themselves no, the Disney's, the Marvels, all that will be the only film. Unless it's, unless the people that are actually are, unless the people that are passionately interested in this start picking up cameras and telling their stories, right. you have the platform to do it. Yeah, for sure. You don't. You don't need anyone's permission to make a movie. Right. No one's. 
Right. You just have to give your permission. You, you just have to give yourself permission to tell your story. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I think one of the, the disheartening things in, you know, and something that we've talked on a little bit too is, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, you even said realistically it's hard, right? Because you have that, you're putting yourself in that vulnerability, but, you know, uh, being at the point of my life, you know, which isn't very far to begin with, but even then, everything is hard, right? Especially as an adult, right? Once you're out of, you know, under, you know, even for some kids now, even still under their parents' care, under a guardian's care, life is still hard. You just have to pick your heart, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think, yeah, just pushing that, which, you know, you're doing now, just pushing that, hey, like, let's be creative. Let's get that experience. Like you even mentioned, like, you want to make a movie? Let, let's do it. Yeah. You know, the, the time is now, like you said, we have our phones, we have, you know, all this amazing technology at, the, at our fingertips where, you know, any, a lot of, not any, but a lot of creative outlets are, are possible. A lot of them can be, become yeah. a reality. And there's no better time than to um, completely redefine what storytelling is, right. you know, and people are passionate for it. And I have no problem in my own work and seeing it in other people's work of them redefining how to tell a story. That to me is so exciting because essentially for me personally is my core of everything that I do is that I'm a storyteller. Right. And that's what the core of so many creatives is, is whether you're a painter, whether you're a musician is really one of the intersecting values of that is that you value telling stories because what do, does a story do? It communicates a lesson. It communicates an emotion. It communicates a feeling. A lot of times it's communicating this feeling. And for me, one of the most powerful things in this medium of film or in video or in documentaries is that you can engineer a feeling. You can engineer it with the right shot, with the right actor, with the right music and the right moment. You can cut this together and in your editing bay, you cut this together and you feel something that you said, you think, wow, I made that. And it makes me feel tense or it makes me feel nostalgic. And the magic about film is that you can now show that to another person and they feel the same thing. And you show it to another dozen people and they feel the same thing. You show it to a million people and they all have the same thing. What do you feel when you know, when you think, what do you feel when you think of Mufasa being thrown off of the cliff by Scar? You know that scene, you know that moment that Simba comes and says, hey, dad, wake up. You know how yeah. many tens of millions of people have felt the exact same thing in that moment? Right. You know what that moment is? You go, oh, shit. Ah, oh, damn it. Like, you start thinking about your own life. You think about your parents and all this. And what a powerful medium we have to communicate yeah. a thought, to communicate a feeling, you know. Um, but going back to what you said, Lucas, um, about the hard work. And it is a lot of hard work to cultivate yourself and to have the discipline and really, really like, like what we're talking about is really shape your creativity into something that can be successful and to something that can be uh, packaged for not just clients, but to build a community around it. Um, right. and, it and it's interesting because, you know, you and I are talking the same language of creative people that have this passion for an art form, but also have a passion to teach it. And I think that's incredibly important. Do you know the, um, do you know the statement by George Bernard Shaw called a splendid torch? I do not know. It's one of the things that um, it's funny because I reread it today earlier today um, because right now is a bottleneck of multiple things being thrown at me for film. And so the next, you know, five days is going to be this marathon. Um, and realistically, like every waking hour is scheduled from here to like Monday. Uh, cause we're gunning up to make a film this weekend mm -hmm. and really questioning why am I doing this? Why is this, you know, why do I throw myself into something that's so difficult? 
to do where you're having to navigate people. Pe navigating people is an incredibly difficult thing. But there was a there's a quote by George Bernard Shaw, and the quote is called The Splendid Torch. Um, and he said in this, I'll read it to you really quick because I think you'll really enjoy this too. He says, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. Mm -hmm. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community. That as long as I live, it is my privilege to do it for whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more that I live. I, rejo I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I have got a hold of for a moment. And I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it off to future generations. That's awesome. Isn't that amazing? That's you know, awesome. and that's one of the things that I keep very close to me in this path of this creative arts path, this path of filmmaking and video production and my commercial video productions is you're right. It is a lot of work and it's a lot of very hard work. But if you keep your mind on investing in people as you go, it makes the work a lot more rewarding sure yeah well thank you so much paul for joining us on this episode it was great speaking to you and and uh, just the inspiration that that you've given i hope that you give to our listeners